<coughs> so I've been playing Baldur's Gate lately. It had been a long time since I last played D&D, and I was feeling a craving for some dice rolls and kobolds, and when you can't get a group together, your next best choice is a CRPG. I've said before that I don't much like CRPGs, but I've found myself having a good time. I still have issues with the game, mostly in comparing it with a proper tabletop session, but time has healed some wounds here. Well, what changed? Between now and a few years ago when I first tried the game, what's different? It's not because of Enhanced Edition that barely changes anything. It's not because of a mod or a fan patch because I'm not using any. Why do I suddenly enjoy a game I once so thoroughly wrote off? Well, it's not because of Baldur's Gate. It's because of the other games I've played over the years. It's because of Shin Megami Tensei and Morrowind and the <laughs> games. Games that take getting used to, games that aren't player friendly, games that make a lot of sacrifices to achieve their unique qualities. And these games I needed help getting into just the same. I wouldn't have played SMT without Persona. I wouldn't have given Morrowind or <laughs> a second chance if not for some great YouTube content that showed me their positive qualities. What I'm getting at is that finding your way into a game can be complicated, so I want to break down the techniques I use to do so. Because it's time we have some positivity on this channel, am I right? First, don't just play games, respect them. This one sounds simple, but it can be hard, because just playing a game and actually giving it a chance are not always the same thing. I and many others went into for the first time without giving it a chance without even knowing it, and dropped it for years as a result. You can't just play a game, you also have to actively engage with it. For instance, when gives the player their first shield before their first real weapon, it's telling you that your first priority should be defense, not offense, which applies throughout the entire game. Even if you're a speedy fast roller with no shield, avoiding damage always comes before dealing it, because enemy and boss damage potential is massive. But if you're not giving the game the proper respect to understand and believe this message, you're not going to put the proper value in defense. You're gonna get slapped, you're gonna get mad, and you're gonna give up. Bloodborne does the exact same thing in reverse, making the first shield you get nearly worthless, and that game is focused much more on offense and retaliation. I know it's a cliché at this point to reference the <laughs> games as good examples of this sort of conveyance, but that's because the difference between people who pick up on that conveyance and those who don't is huge. Let's use a less common example, and those of you who've been around for a bit will recognize this one. At the start of Morrowind, your base running speed is extremely slow compared to other games, unless you've gone out of your way to generate a character with high movement speed. Even then, you're still going to be facing a lot of long walks, and if you want to save money by not using the game's limited fast travel system, your first quest will take you on a very long, very boring walk to Balmora. At most, you might fight a rat, or a scrib, or meet a lady who wants you to do more walking. This is where a lot of people stop playing, but with the magic of understanding, we can overcome this obstacle. This was way back when Bethesda as a developer still had some integrity, so let's not take something as important as the game's title for granted. The game is called The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. After its series title, the game is named after the location it takes place in. Not its central conflict, or its protagonist, or its antagonist, but its setting. And core to the history and culture of Morrowind is its geography, with a giant volcano that formed much of its landmass at the center. That volcano is surrounded by ashlands, volcanic rivers, valleys formed by lava. Morrowind is both figuratively and literally shaped by that volcano. So when the game asks you, five minutes in, to take a long, boring walk past some hills, along a lake shore, through an ash valley, past an imperial town, and over a river, it's asking you to soak in the geography and landscape. It's asking you to gain an appreciation for the land that you'll be spending hours upon hours trekking across and treat it like a real place where the geography really matters. Keep that in mind and that boring walk becomes more like a scenic prelude to the game itself. To put all this short, approach every game like it's going to respect you, and give it the same respect unless it proves not to be worthy of it. By learning to do that, I've been able to play games on their own terms and value them for what they are instead of what I want them to be. Second, don't be afraid to do research. There's a certain stigma around researching games before you play them, and in some cases that stigma is warranted. Some games are super experiential, like Shadow of the Colossus or Journey, and knowing too much in advance can hurt the experience. And especially try not to run into spoilers with games. Don't watch an in-depth review of something you intend to play for yourself. But in a lot of cases, learning about a game before you play it can get you interested enough in it to push past what you may not like. Everyone makes jokes nowadays about how long-form critique videos are a dime a dozen and overplayed, but I think those types of videos do wonders for games. 
I was frustrated with Baldur's Gate, because your party starts so weak and spell casts are so restrictive. Then, on a whim, I watched a few minutes of Noah Caldwell Gervais' video on the Baldur's Gate games. He mentions early on that the original Baldur's Gate is intended to be a low-level D&D adventure, with the party only reaching overpowered status about halfway through the second game, and that simple statement made it all make so much sense to me. I've played a lot of low-level D&D in my life, and making the association between Baldur's Gate and a beginner adventure like the Sunless Citadel was like flipping a light switch. Of course playing a wizard sucks at first. They start badly, but end up as the best class in the game. Of course you miss a lot, your hit bonus sucks at low levels. Noah, Matthew Matosis, even the lesser known guys like Thor High Heels or Bee Mask or Nova Canoe can do wonders. For real, this dude made me briefly for one second consider trying out Final Fantasy XIII again and I fucking hate that game. And this shy guy looking motherfucker has made me want to try out the Sly Cooper games since I never got the chance as a kid. And this Kiwi bastard makes Spy Fox look like high art. Seriously, I can't stress enough, if you love video games, take some spare time away from them to hear other people out. Even if it takes 45 minutes, it can change everything for you. Beyond this are things like developer interviews, where design intentions that slip past you for one reason or another can become clear. Recommendations for Persona 3 always come with the caveat that you can't control your party members directly, and some people even resort to using a mod which allows direct party control to get over that caveat. I often see this part of the game stated as a blatant flaw, a relic of outdated design, and something which future games in the series were right to discard. But by looking into the Design Works interview for Persona 3, it becomes clear that the tactic system was created for a very important reason. If you're a fan of Persona 3, you owe it to yourself to read this interview. Hoshino and Soejima have a lot of valuable insight. Yes, it would have been wrong for this game. There are a lot of RPGs out there where you can control every aspect of your party members, including what kind of underwear they're wearing. But because we wanted the player to relate to the hero more than any other character in Persona 3, we wanted the other characters to feel like other people. It was important to make that distinction. It helped to emphasize the concept of social links, and it also allowed us to show off the improved AI. It would have been extra cool if the party members had been completely free of player control, but we knew that would be pushing it a bit too far, so we gave the player control over their equipment at least. It's true that we got some feedback stating that the party system was too difficult to control effectively, but I'll say that I don't regret doing what we did with it. I'm glad we stuck to our guns on that one. In my opinion, this decision paid off in spades and is one of the key aspects that makes Persona 3 the game it is. Persona 3 fans are very vocal about how weak the casts of Persona 4 and 5 are by comparison, a regular complaint being that they're too subservient to the main character just for being the main character. And they'll cite writing and character arcs when doing so, but the gameplay is just as important. Junpei doesn't feel subservient to because he isn't. He'll follow your general lead, but he won't let you dictate every decision he makes. This applies in the gameplay and in the story, the two intertwining to form his arc. Because I read that developer interview, I can say all of this with confidence, rather than stabbing at it with my intuition. Which really helps when arguing with people on the internet. So, if nothing else, read interviews so that you can totally own people online. They get really mad when you bring up interviews they haven't read. Third, and this is going to be a short point, don't be scared of baby boy peewee casual games. I know this is heresy to all the geeks and gamers in the room, but there's nothing wrong with approaching a hardcore series or genre through its most newcomer-friendly entry. You'll rarely see Shin Megami Tensei fans recommend you jump straight into Devil Summoner or Strange Journey, because those games are deeply entrenched in franchise tradition. Persona 4 and 5, for all of their... not good... things that are in them are excellent entry points into Shin Megami Tensei as a whole, a franchise I consider the Dark Horse MVP of JRPGs. And had I never played the casual-ass casual dating sim that is Persona 4, I would never have played Devil Survivor or Soul Hackers or Digital Devil Saga. Hardcore fighting game fans might make fun of Dragon Ball Fighters for being too simple, but as someone who's never been able to get into fighting games, Fighters gives me more appreciation for them. And it's not like there's any lack of hardcore fighting games out there right now. And Skullgirls has the tutorial to end all tutorials. If you want to get into fighting games, pick up Skullgirls just for the tutorials. You won't regret it. Hardcore horror game fans might write off Resident Evil 4 as a third-person shooter that ruined the series or whatever, but going from RE4 to Remake is what got me into horror games, despite being an actual baby boy peewee scaredy cat. Don't be afraid to start small, my dudes. And finally, one last note, just keep playing games.
Seriously, even when a game is pissing you off or boring you or whatever, give it a little longer. Keep giving more and more games a chance and you'll get where you want to be eventually. Nobody came out of the womb playing Pathologic or I Divine Cybermancy. It takes time to learn to appreciate weird ass games like that. If you're like 16 and you're watching this video, don't feel bad that you aren't some galaxy brain video game master who can play and love anything. You'll get there, just keep going and broadening your horizons. There are still plenty of games I don't like playing. I can't handle RTS games or grand strategy games. I'm not into sports games and I couldn't escape bronze and Street Fighter if my life depended on it. But regardless of any of that, I don't write those genres off anymore, or any genre. Hardcore simulators, text-based games, walking sims, they all have their place, and I appreciate the craft that goes into all of them even if I don't enjoy them. So take it from me. Sometimes you'll try to like a game and it won't pan out. But you can always learn to appreciate them, and that's worth something. And this advice doesn't just apply to games, it also applies to movies, television, music, books, everything. Go nuts, dude. See what you can learn to love. Thanks for watching, guys. I had a more critical, negative sort of video in its early stages, but I figure I ought to lay low on the negative side of things until stuff chills out around here, if you catch my drift. If you guys have anything you'd want me to talk about, I'd love to hear it. Uh, I might even finally get around to that Pyre video I promised way back before the game came out, and trust me, I have a lot to say about that game. Uh, whatever I put together, I hope to see you all around.